Hello, party people, and welcome to How to Think Like the Engine. I teach this two ways. Today, I'm teaching it with slides and PowerPoint. I'm not going to do any uh, SQL Server Management Studio stuff. If you ask me questions, if it's something that I can explain orally really quickly, I'll do that. But otherwise, the other way that I teach it is with SQL Server Management Studio. And tomorrow, that's what I'm going to be doing at these same times. I'm going to do this exact same concept, but I'm going to do it just in SQL Server Management Studio. And that's going to be the session where if you want to go off topic or if you want to ask more in-depth, detailed questions about a particular topic, then I'm able to switch and quickly uh, jump to different demos with it. But in today, kind of consider this as the primer for how to think like the engine. Now, I'm going to make one suggestion to those of y'all in YouTube chat that are following along. Don't answer other people's questions. Because this is really like the first session that a lot of people get to attend in terms of SQL Server training. They're going to be asking all kinds of questions. You're going to be tempted to say, I can answer that for you. Let me go to it. The thing is, I don't know how to say this to you. Sometimes your answers are wrong. And I don't want to have to go jump into the chat and go, actually, wait a minute, everyone. Let's stop the training for a second. I need to connect, correct someone who thinks that they're answering stuff. So just do yourself a favor and watch and learn. Feel free to ask questions, but don't try to be the instructor and teach like take over other people's questions. So let's go ahead and get started. So today's class for how to think like the engine, everything that I'm going to do is revolving around a set of PDFs, a little five page PDF. And I give it to you over at brentosr.com slash go slash engine. You want to have this PDF in hand because it'll make a big difference when you start to think about how SQL Server executes stuff. These PDFs were built with the Stack Overflow database. The nice people over at stackoverflow.com open source their entire database uh, so that you can go in and run demo queries against it. I love it for demos. It's fantastic because it's a really easy to understand database. It's only got a handful of tables in it and they're fairly straightforward. You can download this or the original source material there from the links that are up on the slides. And these slides, the PDFs for them, are all available at that link down there too as well. Brentozar.com slash go slash engine. I give you links over to the database because you're probably going to want to answer questions at some point and go, what happens if I do this? How does this affect the execution plans? All the screenshots for today's materials are done with SQL Server 2019 with the databases running in 2019 compat level. I say that because you're going to want to try to reproduce stuff and you're going to get slightly different screenshots or slightly different execution plans. And I want to empower you to try different things. You're going to find that different things produce different results depending on which uh, compatibility level you're at and the number of CPU cores you have as well. So let's go open up SQL Server Management Studio and go expand the database and go take a look at the list of tables in there. Then we're going to go take a look at the users table over at Stack Overflow. The users table holds exactly what you think it holds, a list of everyone who's ever logged in, posted a comment, posted a question over at stackoverflow.com. And you'll see the very first column in there is ID. That's an identity column. Starts at one and goes up to a bajillion. Everyone gets an ID when they sign up. And you'll notice up there that the ID column has a little key next to it. That means that this is the clustering key of the table. The table itself is literally sorted by that ID. Now, there are edge cases. There are times where people create that little key and then they don't sort the table by that order. For a lot of the stuff that I'm going to say today, I'm doing generalizations to help get you started quickly. We're going to focus on what happens 99.9% .9 of the time. 99.9% .9 of the time, when you see that little key, that means that's the way that the table's actually sorted. So what does that look like? Let's take the first piece of paper in your five-page handout. The first piece of paper, the white piece of paper, which is pictured up here on screen, is a page 
from the table itself, aka the clustered index. And when you're just getting started with databases, basically think that every time that I say clustered index, I also mean the table itself. And we get more into detail on some of the edge cases around what that means in my other training classes. But if you look at the data, it's sorted by ID. Look over there, it starts at 1, 2, 3, 4. It looks like maybe some users were deleted and it jumps up to 535 and so forth. It's not stored by person's name. There's a display name column in there. It's not sorted by location. It's sorted by ID. And so every time we get a new user, we just tack them on to the end of these little pieces of paper. And the database really is just a stack of pieces of paper. Well, not literally, obviously, but digital pieces of paper. Each one of these pages is eight kilobytes in size, really tiny amount of data. But if you opened up your database, the data file, the MDF, it's going to start at one object and just go start reading through all kinds of objects. Every object gets its own set of 8K pages. They're mixed in between with each other, too. Sometimes you'll have some customers and some sales and so forth. A page is the smallest unit of data that SQL Server works with. SQL Server doesn't start by reading an individual row. For example, if I want to go find my user's row in the Stack Overflow database, SQL Server doesn't know how to dive bomb directly into just my row. It's going to read the entire 8K page that has my row on it. SQL Server works with these pages not just to read them up into memory, but also to write them down to disk. When you do things like inserts, updates, and deletes, SQL Server needs to get that piece of paper that has the row you want on it. It needs to get that up into memory, make the change, and then write that back down to disk as well. In a perfect world, your query is easy to understand. The data that you want is just on one 8K page, and SQL Server can rapidly figure out which 8K page that is. SQL Server is able to grab that page directly out of memory and then just read the data out for you as is. For example, if I say, go get me user ID number 12345, SQL Server can dive bomb in to exactly the page where user 12345 lives and read that data out for you right away. That's not the world that you and I live in. You and I are data professionals, and we work with queries that are written by all kinds of people. We work with all kinds of sloppy table designs. In our real world, our query is not always easy to understand. The data that we want is often spread across many pages. For example, people will run reports. People will grab data from several tables and join them together. SQL Server doesn't know exactly which pages you want because it's not like you're specifying exactly ID 12345. Often, SQL Server doesn't have that page cached in memory. So SQL Server's got to go get it from disk because our boss got kind of cheap on our SQL Server and didn't put much memory in it. And then often our queries ask for a whole bunch of work to be done on that data, summing, grouping things together, ordering the data. So in the real world, the work that SQL Server does involves lots of reads from all kinds of pages, from all kinds of tables. The more work that we ask SQL Server to do, the slower our queries are going to get. My job in this next two-hour session is to get you to think like SQL Server so that you understand when you run a query how SQL Server going to guess which rows are involved? What are going to be the most efficient ways to get those rows? How much resources should we allocate? There's no magic built into SQL Server. And when I start to deconstruct this stuff with these 8K pages, you'll realize that SQL Server does the same kinds of things that you have to do if all you have is 8K pages and blank pieces of paper to work on. 
in this class, you are going to be SQL Server, and I am going to be the end user executing queries. And it's going to be up to you to figure out how you want to build execution plans in plain English. Now, I'm going to start the first one for you. I'm going to start with an easy question. I'm going to start with a query that has no where clause on it. I'm going to say, go get me all of the IDs from the users table. Now, since this is the only copy of the data that we have, we're not starting with any other indexes, any other copies of the table. This is the only copy of the table we have. My execution plan in plain English is going to be to read through all of the pages. Doesn't matter if I start with the last page for this index or the first page for this index. I'm going to read through the whole entire copy, yelling IDs out loud as fast as I find them. Let's execute the query, and let's see what SQL Server's execution plan is. In Management Studio, you can run a query with the actual execution plan turned on to see how SQL Server executed it. And we read these plans from right to left. That isn't the only way. Some people read it in other ways, and there can be times when other ways are useful. But for now, we're going to read from right to left. The top right thing is the first thing that SQL Server did. In this case, it's the only thing that SQL Server did. SQL Server scanned through the clustered index, the table itself. And it pulled out about 300,000 rows. There's about 300,000 rows in this relatively old, small copy of the Stack Overflow database. How much work was this query? A classic problem that we run into in query tuning is I want to know how much work a query was so that when I tune it, I can understand whether it's getting better or worse. The baseline way, the very starting point way to measure queries is to ask, how much data did you read? And the way you find that out is by turning on this option. It's totally safe. It only affects your own session. doesn't affect anyone else's session. Set Statistics I.O. on turns on a little measurement in the Messages tab that says, how many logical reads did we do? Logical reads equals the number of 8K pages that we read in order to satisfy this query. That's not the only way to measure queries. It's the most common way to measure queries. And generally speaking, the less data that you read, the faster your query is going to go. Part of my work in here sometimes is breaking people from bad habits. Sometimes people will say, well, actually, Brent, I like to look at physical reads because that's more effective to figure out how much well, we're asking storage to do. You're wrong. You really just want to look at logical reads because that doesn't matter whether the data was in memory or on disk. Because you can't predict what's going to be in memory at the time your query runs. When your query runs, maybe some of the data is cached, maybe it isn't. Well, if I could just reduce physical reads, then I know the query is going to run faster. Not necessarily, because if this query runs all the time, it might all be up in memory. You might not have any physical reads. By reducing logical read count, that guarantees, in most cases, that your query is going to run faster. Is 7,000 pages a lot? We'll flash back to before the pandemic, back when you used to go into an office. I know some of you still do. Back when you used to go into an office and you would have to reload the copier or the printer in order to fill it up with more uh, sets of paper. Remember there was something called a ream, which was a package of paper. Well, 7,405 pieces of paper is about 15 reams worth of paper. So as you're executing these queries, I want you to think about having 15 reams of, these, of this paper that you have to go through and find the results. Because now it's your turn. 
I did the first one for you. Now, over in YouTube chat, I want you to tell me how you're going to execute this query in plain English when you have 15 reams of this paper. Go find me all the users where last access date is greater than July the 1st of 2014. Go. I'll have a sip of my tasty beverage. Uh, DL Vega, you're welcome. Glad you're enjoying the uh, session and my work there. So one of the things you might notice there as you're starting to type out your answers is that the data is not organized by last access date. So someone's going to go, well, what I would do is I would create an index. You don't get the ability to do that. You're the database engine. Lord Bobo says, or Boo Boo says, geez, I have to look at every piece of paper. And Alpha Kronos says, break out the highlighter. Well, you don't want to touch the 8K pages. You, want, you don't want to lock them any more than you have to, because remember, everyone is trying to share these 8K pages um, uh, all of the time. Your execution plan would be to go through all of the pages again, saying the record out loud whenever their last access date is greater than 7 1 of 2014. Now, one of you says, let me go through and see who it was. Al, uh, Cape Monster. Oh, Cape Monster, 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 uh, Monster, Monster, Monster. Um, says, I want to split it across lots of workers. You know what? So does SQL Server. Let's look at the execution plan for this query. The execution plan for this query has something new in it, parallelism. It says parallelism because SQL Server now decided it wanted to parallelize this operation. You see this little racing stripe in here. It wants to parallelize this operation to spread it across multiple people. So why is it parallelizing that now? Well, before, I, when I had a, a nowhere clause on it, SQL Server knew that as soon as it started finding rows, it could immediately start yelling them out full speed because every row matched. Now, not every row is going to match. So SQL Server is parallelizing this work so a bunch of you can go into the office supply closet where those 15 reams of paper are stored and then just speak up whenever you find rows that match. Interesting that this was actually more work than it was before. Now, we were measuring queries in the sense of logical reads. Those logical reads, let's take a look at before and after. Before, when we had no where clause versus now that we have the where clause, we're actually reading more 8K pages now that we have parallelism involved. How cool is that? The first lesson here is that when we use a WHERE clause, just because you're returning less data doesn't mean you're doing less work. You can actually be doing a little bit more work that even requires parallelism to get involved when you start filtering data. There are some extra reads when queries go parallelism, and we talk about that more in my Mastering Query Tuning and Mastering Server Tuning class. There's another difference between these two execution plans as well. In the first query, SQL Server just did the data and dumped it out. The second query, there's something new inside here. The new thing inside here is Clippy. Clippy says, hey, buddy, looks like you're querying by last access date. You know what would really help is if you had an index on last access date to pre-sort the data for you. I kind of think of the missing index requests as like Clippy, that dancing paper clip who used to be in old versions of Microsoft Office. And he'd say things like, hey, buddy, looks like you're trying to write a resume. Maybe I could help. And you weren't trying to write a resume. You were trying to write your resignation notice. But of course, he didn't know any better. SQL Server put in a little extra work to recommend missing indexes here because this query is more expensive and because we're starting to filter by last access date. Another way we can compare these two queries is by hovering our mouse over the select operator. If I hover my mouse over the select operator, I get this thing called estimated. I also get the edge of my green screen right here, which is also kind of fun because I can be like dee, 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 ah! <laughs> things that make me laugh even after years of presenting. Estimated subtree cost. 
estimated subtree cost was about 5.8 before, and now that we have the where last access date filter, the estimated subtree cost is a little cheaper because SQL Server decided to parallelize that work across multiple cores. Estimated subtree cost a long time ago, back in the late 1990s, meant the number of seconds that it would take on one person's machine at Microsoft. Those days are long gone. That machine is long gone. Today, estimated subtree cost is just a rough abstracted number to guess how much CPU and I.O. work is involved in a query. It has nothing to do with modern hardware. Microsoft hasn't updated, excuse me, updated it in decades. So Kendra Little coined the term query bucks, and we had our artist commission out a sketch of a bunch of query bucks with different members of the community. So when I'm looking at queries and I'm comparing them, that estimated subtree cost, you'll often hear to me refer to it in query bucks, that doesn't actually match up with how hard the query was to execute. It's just an estimate from before the query started of how hard SQL Server thought that query was going to be. It's not really useful for query tuning to estimate, you know, which one of these plans is going to be better. It's a lot like your project manager. You know your project manager, anytime they come in and you know, someone asks the project manager, how long will it take the data person to build a new report based on profit? Doesn't matter what the what you ask for, the project manager is like, oh, two weeks, uh, I think two weeks. That, that estimated cost is really kind of a just rough guess. It's just made up. All right, let's add something else to the query. I want you to order the results by last access date. How are you going to execute this in plain English and one of the things that you're going to say is, well, I'm going to read through the pages and I'll put them in a stacks based on where the last access date is. No, because each page has multiple people on it. People will have different last access dates. You can't just sort people in different places or sort pages in different places when multiple people on the same page have different last access dates. Another thing that you're going to say is, well, I'm going to get out a pair of scissors and I'm going to cut these pages up and then sort them that way. Nope, 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 nope. You don't get to write to these pages. This is a set of pages that are shared by everyone. And if you wanted to cut them up, which you could if you did an insert, update, or delete, you would need locks on there that would get pretty ugly. We need to figure out how we're going to do this in a cooperation way. Now, seven old days says, I want to shout them out one at a time and then shout them out in order. Okay, as a human being, how are you going to do that? Because here's the thing, I know you aren't that bright, and I'm not just speaking to seven there, I'm speaking to all of you. You're not bright enough to remember the hundreds of thousands of users, you're going to need some kind of crutch. And Derek McDonald nails it. McD Daryl McDonald says, I'm going to rewrite them to a new sheet. Bingo, Derek, that's exactly what SQL Server is going to do. What we're going to do is we're going to read through all of the pages, saying out whenever we find a rows that match, and we're going to write something down. We're going to grab ourselves a scratch pad, and every time that we find a matching row, we're going to write something down on our scratch pad. Here's the next question. What are you writing down? Let's go back to the query and take a look. What am I going to write down on my scratch pad every time I find a row? Am I going to write down the about me? No, because I don't need it. Am I going to write down the age? No, because I don't need it. Am I going to write down the last access date? Yes. Several of you are in here writing over in YouTube chat. I'm just going to write down the ID. No, 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 no. Because if you only write down the ID, every time you find another row, how do you know where it goes? 
you have to write down both the ID and the last access date so that you can put them in order. Now, Derek says everything in the row. You don't want to write anything extra because I know y'all, not only are you not that bright, you're also extremely lazy and you don't want to write down anything you don't have to. If we don't have any need for the location column or the age column, why write them down if the query's not asking for it? SQL Server is just as lazy as you are, if not more so. So what we're going to write down is we're going to write down ID and last access date. Now, let's go take a look at SQL Server's execution plan. Now, with SQL Server's execution plan, every one of these icons is kind of a self-contained program. You could think of it as an app on your phone, or I like to think of it as a microservice. And often, these have very limited capabilities. This first clustered index scan, all it's doing is just scanning the clustered index. And every time a row matches what we're looking for, in this case, greater than July 1st, it's going to yell out those IDs and last access dates out in an arrow up to the new operator. All this thing is responsible for is just reading the clustered index and yelling out rows. And if you hover your mouse over here, it even shows you what it's outputting, in this case, just ID and last access date. After this arrow, we have the sort. And the sort is responsible for hearing what the last access dates and IDs are, writing them down, and sorting them as we go. If you notice, SQL Server's also parallelized this one as well, because it's a lot of work. So let's compare these two execution plans. The one on the left-hand side is when we didn't have the order by. The one on the right-hand side is when we did have an order by. The old estimated subtree cost before we added the order by, the old one had an estimated subtree cost of about 5.6 query bucks. The new one, now that we added the order by, has a cost of about 13 query bucks. And there's something else that's new inside here, too. That new thing is a memory grant. That is this. SQL Server needs space to do its work. And I like using a scratch pad just to illustrate that it's something different than the 8K pages we were working with earlier. But you know what? It's actually the same. SQL Server allocates empty 8K pages up in memory in order to run your query. Uh, Hero says, sir, will this lecture be available after the live stream ends? Hero, no, unfortunately, you're going to have to pay attention. Can you believe it? Oh my god! You have to pay attention for once! <gasps> oh my god, if only someone had told you before the instructions. Yes, Hero. This lecture will be available after the live stream ends. It says down there at brentozar.com slash go slash engine. There's a video of it that's been up there for almost 10 years. Can you believe it? People have been learning before you. People got in early. It's unbelievable. Don't worry. I'll never tell. And this certainly won't be on YouTube for other people to see that Hero asked that question. Okay, so the cost is up by a lot, and we have these new 8K pages uh, that SQL Server uh, uh, allocated in memory in order to do the sorting. You can see more about that if you right-click over on the Select Operator and go into Properties. There's all these properties about memory grant info. These are all measured in kilobytes, and they're in a really odd order. When Microsoft wants to put data up on the screen, they seem to have one of two approaches. Either they alphabetize it, which makes no sense for diagnostics or storytelling, because stuff's all out of order. Desired is way up here. Required is down here. Granted is up here. Then way down there, how much it used is down here. And then if it went serial is over here. It's kind of scattered all over in terms of troubleshooting. 
They either do that or they load up the data cannon and they just point it at the screen and fire and randomly data gets sprayed all over out of order. In this case, it's alphabetically, which doesn't make any sense in terms of storytelling, but here we go. SQL Server, when it designed this query plan, said, I would like 14 megabytes worth of memory. At the time of execution, SQL Server said, well, you can get up to 2.6 gigs. So I'm going to go ahead and grant you all 14 megabytes you, that you asked for. You didn't have to wait any time. It happened instantly when your query started running. And then when the query finished, we tracked that we only needed actually about eight and a half megabytes of that memory in order to run. In a perfect world, that's what happens. In a perfect world, SQL Server accurately guesses how much memory your query needs, and it has that much available. In the real world, that's often not what happens at all. This is a screenshot from a completely different query where SQL Server desired six gigs worth of RAM in order to run the query. Unfortunately, we just couldn't give it that much, so we only gave it 900 megabytes worth of RAM. SQL Server knew this was going to be an ugly query that needed a lot of memory for things like sorts and joins. It just couldn't get it. And when the query ran out of memory, you'll see a little yellow bang on some execution plan operators saying, warning, I use tempdb to spill data. Because one of the things that's weird about SQL Server is it tries to guess how much scratch space you need at the beginning of the query's execution. And if more data comes back, it doesn't matter if there's more data or more memory available in RAM. You just get whatever you had, and that's it. And the rest of it, if you start to exceed it, ends up spilling to TempDB. That's kind of a bummer. That's also one of the reasons why people will say that my query ran really quickly in dev, and then it blows in production. Well, in dev, you were the only person running queries. And in production, lots of people are running queries. And in production, any one uh, query, by default, just any one running query can grab 25% of your SQL Server's memory. Just one. It doesn't take a whole lot of 25% before you completely run out of memory. That's when you have problems caching data. For example, your page life expectancy crashes through the floor. All right, so let's add one more thing to the query. Instead of just getting the ID, let's select star. That doesn't change the shape of the query, or shape of the query plan. But it does change this. Oh man, does it change this. This query sucks. And I'm not one of those people who says, never select star, select star is evil. But select star is bad in very specific uh, circumstances. Does selecting star make SQL Server work harder to read the data? Your first answer is going to be yes. Your first answer is going to be wrong. That's OK. That's why you're here in a training class. We're not going to tell anyone you were already reading all of the 8K pages. You were already reading all of them. So reading more columns out of those 8K pages doesn't really make a difference. You already had to crack these 8K pages open and digest the whole thing. Do we work harder to write the data on our scratch pad? Yes. Because now, instead of just writing the ID and last access date, because the user did select star, we have to write down every column. The problem there isn't the select star. The problem is just that the more columns you ask for, the longer this is going to take. The more space that it's going to take, the more memory that it's going to take to do the query. What about this? 
sorting by uh, uh, what Eric says or uh, ear says what happened when the index is not there there is no index there's only the clustered index we've only got one copy of the table so far so next up do we work harder to sort the data the developer in me would have said no because it's still the same number of rows if it's say 150,000 rows does it take longer to sort 150,000 IDs or select stars but it turns out that sorting all of the data is actually way harder because SQL Server has to move all of this data in and out of the CPU cache as well. And then finally, do we work harder to output the data? And yes, it takes longer to say more data over the network, the more columns that you say. As a database administrator, that's what I used to focus on is be like, don't return columns you don't need because it takes longer to push all that data over the network. That's like the least of our problems. The number one problem inside here is the cost of that sort. The cost of the sort is now up to 97% of the cost of the query. And the query's cost altogether isn't fixed. The query's cost has skyrocketed. It used to be 13 query bucks when we were only selecting the ID. The query cost now that we're doing select star is 871. Christopher Style says inflation. Yeah, in an extreme case. I don't have a problem with people doing select star. I really couldn't care less. Because often you need a whole lot of columns in order to set, to paint the uh, results pane that you need to show a screen on the web for somebody to run a report. You often need a lot of columns. People want more than one or two columns. The problem comes in when you're asking SQL Server to sort it or join it with other tables. And that's when I start to say, hey, if we could do the sorting on the application tier, I'd actually be happier. SQL Server Enterprise is $7,000 US per CPU core. $7,000 US per CPU core. So if I can avoid doing that CPU intensive work of sorting on the SQL Server, I'd much rather do that. I'd rather push that down to the app tier. Application servers are, carry the one, $0 per CPU core. So I'd rather push it down onto the application tier where we can afford to throw lots of hardware at it without that coming back to bite us. Especially since it keeps happening every time you run the query. Let's change one thing about the query. Let's have it go 100 times. If you put a number after the go statement, you can run a query multiple times in SQL Server. So like if you want to do a denial of attack or denial of service attack against your own SQL Server. I suppose this would be one way to do it. What you and I wish would happen is we wish that SQL Server would go through and write down all the columns over on its scratch page. Then it would go sort the message or sort all the data by last access date. Then it would keep this valuable data around so that we could reuse that the next time we see this query. <coughs> After all, I've already done all the work. I've already done all the filtering. The data is sorted right here on my scratch page. Why don't I just hang on to this for a minute? It's certainly doable. There's another database platform that does this. Oracle has results caching. Every time I hear about a cool feature that Oracle has, I always get jealous and I'm like, man, I wish I had result set caching. But then I am reminded that Oracle is $47,000 per CPU core. I told you SQL Server was expensive at seven grand a CPU core. Oracle, $47,000 a CPU core. Also, of course, because Larry Ellison likes to buy Hawaiian Islands and sponsor Formula One cars and racing and uh, racing sailboats and things like that. Microsoft, they don't bother spending money on racing sailboats or Hawaiian Islands or developers. All they do is they just abuse your SQL server and pass the savings on to you. So here, if you go through and see I'm running the query a hundred times in a row, you see my CPU is doing all kinds of work because SQL Server caches data pages, not query results. SQL Server caches data pages, 
not query results. I know a lot of developers will say, it doesn't really cost that much because the data I'm querying is in cache. Well, the data pages are, but you know how you did a where and an order by and a group by? That isn't cached, and we have to redo that work every time. So we're going to need to figure out a way to performance tune that over on the database engine side, and that way is going to involve indexes. So we've been going for about 40 minutes. What have we learned so far? First off, set statistics IO on shows you the number of 8K pages that were read by your query. This is the most useful uh, way of measuring query performance before and after your tuning work. Aware without a supporting index is going to mean most likely a table scan. Order by without a supporting index is going to mean a whole lot of expensive licensing CPU work. And query SQL Server caches data pages, not query results or our temporary workspace. What you're going to learn in the next section of the lecture is the differences between clustered and non-clustered indexes and the differences between seeks and scans. But before we get to that, I'm going to push a button harder. Before we get to that, I'm going to take a second to talk about an upcoming series of lectures. I have Fundamentals Week coming up May 6th through 10th. In Fundamentals Week, I teach you how to use my first responder kit, fundamentals of index tuning, query tuning, much more. It's a whole entire week, and it's kind of like a conference run just by me. Same exact kind of thing as this, except we're in a private room, private room, uh, as opposed to being out on YouTube. This one does cost money, but of course, that's how I get to pay my rent. Woohoo! So that's coming up May 6th through 10th. That is also available recorded, too, as well, if you want to buy the recorded class season pass for the fundamentals class as well. Uh, Michael asks over on YouTube, Michael asks, if I select a billion rows without a where clause, does the table get locked until the data is transferred through the wire? So Michael, or, uh, the, the kind of good news is, is it doesn't matter whether it get, gets locked or not. If you select a billion rows, you're going to be fired before the query completes. The company staff will show up at your desk. They will kindly lock the workstation for you and escort you away from it. And then they will pull the workstation's plug from the wall to ensure that you never do anything like that again. Good news. I'm glad, I'd rather that you asked me about that instead of trying to do it yourself. Now let's go back to the lecture. <laughs> So what you're going to learn next, let's see here. So now let's go on to, to the next uh, part of the lecture, non-clustered indexes. So before we only had the white pages, now I want you to get the second page of your handouts, the black pages of your handouts. This is what happens when you run that create index statement. If you say create index IX last access date and ID on the users table on last access date and ID, SQL Server actually materializes this into a set of 8K pages. One of the first things that you're going to notice is that this copy of the table only has last access date and ID. Non-clustered indexes are kind of like reporting copies of the table. They let you pick and choose which columns are on that table. Sometimes clients will come to me and say, we're thinking about breaking up into a table into multiple copies. One co copy will have just the queries that are the uh, columns that we hardly ever query. The other copy of the table will have the columns that we use all the time. You don't have to do that. SQL Server will do that for you. If you just create indexes, that let you pick which columns you want to uh, include. Now, another thing that you're going to notice then is that you now have to do twice as many writes. Every time that you're doing a delete or an insert, SQL Server has to grab both of the related pages up into memory, has to make the changes to them, and then flush them down to storage. Even with just one index, you're effectively doubling the amount of work that you're asking your storage to do. The more indexes you have, the slower your storage goes. 
This is especially important up in the day and age of the cloud. I know a lot of SQL Server folks will say, oh, I'm getting all these 15 second IO warning errors that my storage can't keep up. And then we go in and then we look at their tables and they have 15, 20 indexes on every table. Like, yo, you are personally amplifying your rights by 15, 20 X. You're doing a denial of service attack against your storage. You don't want any extra indexes that aren't being used because you're causing the storage to slow down. I did say deletes and inserts there. Every time we add a row, every time we delete a row, updates are a little bit different. Updates only affect the copies of the table that have the columns involved in the update. For example, let's say that I get another year older. Please, God, let me get another year older. Not today, necessarily, but just, you know, when it's the right time. Uh, say that we update users to set age equals age plus one. Since age isn't on the index on last access date and ID, I don't have to worry about it. So basically, you want to think about when you're designing your indexes to avoid indexing hot columns. And what I mean by hot columns is columns that change all the time. Quantity in stock, customer bank balance, last access date. It's true, actually, at Stack Overflow, every time you touch a web page, that gets written to a database. In theory, I probably don't want to index a column like that because it changes all the time. I have to figure out how to strike the balance of having enough indexes to make my queries go fast, but not so many indexes that I slow down my inserts, updates, and deletes. Inserts, updates, and deletes, though, we cover those in the other classes like Fundamentals Week. Let's go back to Selects and go back to our Select Query. Now, I'm going to just do Select ID from users where last access date is greater than 2014.07.01. I'm going to get rid of the Select star and just do the ID. Now that I have this index, what does my execution plan look like for this query? Now that I have my index, it's sorted by last access date. So I can just grab this black piece of paper. I can jump directly to 2014.07.01. I don't have to read all the ones before. I can jump ahead directly to that and then go read the IDs out in order. That's exactly what SQL Server does. We have a new execution plan here. The new plan says index seek before we were dealing with scans on my index on last access date and ID. It doesn't say clustered index anymore. It says non clustered index, the reporting copy of the table. This is why I like to name my indexes based on the columns that they're on. So I can see right away and go, oh, yeah, he's working with the copy of the, of the table that's organized by last access date and ID. There's no sort in here either, because the data is already sorted by last access date. When you're looking at your demo copies of the table, you can see you can jump straight to one date and read them out ordered by last access date. Because I don't have to read so many rows and because I don't have to do the sorting, the cost on this thing is now down to less than one query buck. Even if I was doing select star, the cost on this has plummeted. So why is it so cheap? Well, you probably can guess that because I'm not reading the whole entire table, Less reads means I'm running the query more quickly. And that's true. Here, I'm doing two versions of the query. Index equals one always relates to the clustered index of the table, was the first index that we went and created. The clustered index of the table was doing about 8,000 logical reads. But when we let SQL Server choose now with our new non-clustered index, we read like 20 times less data. Reading less pages means your query is going to go faster. But there's another part of this. So far, I've been running set statistics IO on. I'm going to run something a little different up top. I'm going to say set statistics time and IO on. 
Set Statistics Time also adds more messages in our Messages tab that tells us how many CPU ticks we used. Now, this one's not quite as accurate as logical reads because it can fluctuate up and down based on what else is happening on your SQL Server at the time, whether the CPU SQL Server was in balanced power saving mode, it may have clocked down the CPUs. But just as a general guess, we can see here that doing that sort was about three times as much CPU time as once when we used the index. The index eliminated the sort. So the index made our query go faster because we read less data. It also helped because we didn't have to do a sort. The index took away all kinds of work in the query. That's one of the reasons that we call an index like this a covering index. Covering, it doesn't refer to really the, the, the a term that you would use when you type create index. Covering just refers to the fact that it covers everything we need for this query. SQL Server doesn't need to go back to the clustered index, gets everything that it needs from the non-clustered index, so it covered all of the problems. If we change the query, that index may not cover it anymore. We'll come back to that in a while. One thing I need to be careful with, though, is as I show you execution plans and I say they get better, I need to be specific and I don't want you to think that the index seek was the thing that made it better, because it's not. Index seek has nothing to do with good or bad. The word seek sounds tiny, sounds like a noise that a bird would make. Seek! Seek. An index seek sounds like it's hardly any data at all, but check out how many rows came back. You probably think that the term seek means we're just going to dive bomb in and read just a tiny amount of data to get what we need and get out, but that's not what seek means at all. You probably also think that scan means we're going to read the whole entire thing. That's not what that means at all. To illustrate it, let's change the query. Go find all the users who accessed the system since the year 1800. Pro tip, Stack Overflow, not around in the days of covered wagons. But even though we specified a really old date like that, and this query will return all of the rows in the table, we still get an index seek. Well, that doesn't seem to make any sense. You're probably thinking that doesn't SQL Server know that it's going to read the whole entire table? Nope. SQL Server knows there's a lot of rows involved, but it also knows that there might be data before that. There could be data from the 1790s. Maybe Thomas Jefferson accessed Stack Overflow. How do I write a Declaration of Independence? I'm sure there's a declare joke in there somewhere. SQL Server can't guarantee that. Sure, we have statistics that tell it likely how much data is distributed in different areas, but it's not a guarantee. It's not a constraint. It's just a rough guess. So to SQL Server, the term seek just means he knows where the starting point is. It could be the first row of the table. It also doesn't mean that he's going to stop reading at a certain point. He can start at the beginning of the table and read the whole entire thing, like what we just saw with 1800. That shows up as an index seek. The term seek strictly refers to the starting point. Scan also means I'm just going to start at one end. I don't know what data I'm going to find, but whatever data I find at that end of the index, I'm going to take it. But I can bail out at any time. Scan doesn't mean that you need to read the whole entire thing. For example, let's say that I give you a query that says, go select uh, the top 10 star from the users table. There's no order by, there's no filter. SQL Server knows that we just want any 10 rows, doesn't matter where they are. So SQL Server is going to grab the first page off the top of the index, read out until it finds 10 rows. That is technically a scan. 
It's not a seek, because SQL Server's not jumping to a specific point at the table. SQL Server's just grabbing a result off the top and rock and rolling. This only does five logical reads. It reads five 8K pages. And you cannot build an index that will make this go faster. When you see seek, all that means is that SQL Server is jumping to a specific point. It doesn't mean it's a small amount of data. And when you see scan, that just means that SQL Server starting at either end of the index. Could be the beginning, could be the end. I don't want you to walk away from this class thinking that getting to index seeks throughout the execution plan is a successful finish line, because it's not. All right, so what have we top, talked about so far? Indexes are literally copies of a table. Copies of a table are good because they reduce page reads and CPUs for sorts. Copies of a table can be bad because they slow down your delete, update, and insert work. True story, funny thing, I had a, a video go live on TikTok, and I talked about DUIs, referring to deletes, updates, and inserts. Most people call them inserts, updates, and deletes, IUDs. I don't think that's quite as cool of an acronym. Not the DUIs are cool either, but TikTok actually took my video down because they're like DUIs are off limits. We don't talk about those. And I was like, oh, that's, that's educational. All right, cool. Seek means that we're going to jump to one area and start uh, reading. It doesn't mean we're going to read just a little bit of data, and it could mean that we read the whole table. Scan means that we're going to start at either end of the index, and we may read the whole thing, but we may only read a little bit. Neither seek nor scans refers to how much we're going to read. What you're going to learn in the next section is key lookups when how SQL Server has to merge the results of two different indexes and how it decides to do that and when it decides to do that. So let's go back in our query to just selecting IDs. If I only select IDs, then this index perfectly covers what we're looking for. SQL Server can dive bomb into one last access date and then read the data out ordered by last access date. But let's change something about what we're selecting. I'm not going to select star, because that's evil. And I say that sarcastically. I'm going to add two columns. I'm going to add display name and age. Display name and age are not in here. Display name and age are only in the clustered index. Um, Christopher, that's a great question. You can test that yourself in Management Studio, though. I'm going to leave, leave that to you. Or if you want to join tomorrow's webcast, I'll show it to you. So here, how am I going to get display name and age? Well, one way that I could do it is that I could still use the index. I could start by seeking over to July the 1st of 2014. I could go make a list of all the rows that match. And for every row that matches, I could look up on the clustered index to go get their display name and age. SQL Server will do that. SQL Server will use two different copies of a table in order to get the results that it wants. Here's how it works. Now, so far, when we've been dealing with queries, we've been dealing with kind of one row execution plans. But now it's got two rows or a double decker kind of thing in here. I said we read from the top right. That's exactly what we do here is we look at the first thing that happens is a SQL Server did an index seek. It dive bombed in to July the 1st of 2014. It read out the rows that match, and then it did key lookups. For every one of the rows that it found up here, down here, SQL Server says, I have user ID number 12345. What's his display name and age? Now's a time when I need to tell you that I lied to you earlier. Earlier, when I said that I created this index based on last access date and ID, I didn't need to. All I really had to do was create the index on last access date, and SQL Server would have already added ID for me. Because for every row that I find in here, I have to be able to join down to here. 
For example, if I find someone with a last access date of July the 1st, well, where do they match up in the table itself? So SQL Server always includes the clustering key of the table, whether you asked for it or not. I just told you that I created the index on last access date and ID in order to get the basics down so that we could drill on to more cool stuff later. Now, when you see this inside an execution plan, whenever you see this, oh, uh, uh, I'm going to hit a couple of uh, uh, questions that came in over uh, YouTube over there. So um, Benjamin said, these are my favorite uh, answers over in office hours when Brent tells someone, hey, you, you're smart enough to ask the question, go, go figure it out yourself real quick and ask the SMS. And that's absolutely true. Um, Christopher follows up with, I just need to find a bigger sandbox to play in. Darn work task keeps getting in my way. The Stack Overflow 2010 database is 10 gigabytes, 10 gigabytes. That's a memory card for a camera. That's 32 gigabytes. You could probably run the Stack Overflow database on a camera. That's how easy it is to run that thing. You can totally run it on your laptop. I totally encourage folks to do it. Stop making excuses. Go set yourself up. Do it either on, on your own desktop that you've got that you do. You do have a desktop or laptop, right? You're not attending this class on your phone. You might be, but who knows? <laughs> All right, so, so to come back here, the danger of me going off topic there for a second when I start to answer questions. So I said, that's why SQL Server always includes the key so that it can join back and forth between these two copies of the table. When you see an execution plan like this, an index seek plus a key lookup, when you see this execution plan style, what you want to do is you want to hover your mouse over. Uh, oh, <laughs> someone says, Randy says, let me let me show this real quick. Oh, uh, it's this one over here. Um, Randy says it looks like that's uh, someone flipping them off. It is. It's Anthony Bourdain. It's a painting of Anthony Bourdain by Cassie Ott, an artist out of North Carolina, which I absolutely adore. She's wonderful. So when you see that classic uh, index seek plus a key lookup design pattern, that's when you want to look at the output down there and look to see if you want to add that uh, over to your non clustered indexes. If you're constantly querying for age and display name, display name, it might be time to add that to your indexes so that you don't have to do that back and forth key lookup thing. Especially because I lied to you again. In order to get that execution plan, I didn't use 2014. I used 3014. Y'all didn't catch it because you were too busy playing around in chat, which is okay. That's fine. SQL Server will do this when there's not a whole lot of data. But if I go actually run the query that we were running earlier, 2014, SQL Server ignores the index altogether. SQL Server says, I don't want to do this back and forth key lookup thing. I'm just going to ignore the index and go scan the whole entire table. SQL Server has to make this decision about which one is going to be more efficient. And that decision is called the tipping point. When SQL Server has to say there are going to be too many reads back and forth with all these key lookups, I'd rather just go ahead and scan the whole entire table. And when I tell you that there's a tipping point, people want to know what the exact number is. That is not how SQL Server works. There's not a specific fixed number like 5% of the rows or 10% of the rows. And I document how that works over at brentozar.com slash go slash tipping. To find out how SQL Server makes that decision, what we're going to do is we're going to run two versions of our query. Now, I am not a big fan of using index hints and in production queries, but I do like using them to understand how SQL Server makes a decision one way or another. So in the beginning, I'm going to run it unhinted so that SQL Server chooses which indexes it's going to use. 
then I'm going to hint SQL Server to go use my index on last access date. And hints in SQL Server are as exactly the same as at home. When your partner hints at you that the, the trash is starting to smell, that's not really a hint, it's a command. SQL Server works the same way. When there are no hints, SQL Server decided to do the table scan. When I hinted it, it went ahead and did the index seek plus key lookups. If I hover my mouse over the select up here, I get that estimated subtree cost. Estimated subtree cost of about 13 query bucks. And if I hover my mouse down here over the other select, I get 47 query bucks. SQL Server is generally going to choose the cheapest execution plan that will get us across the finish line. And that execution plan is based on how many rows it thinks are going to come back. A table scan has a predictable cost because no matter what SQL Server finds inside the data, it knows it's just going to have to read all of the rows. Index seeks and key lookups are different. Key lookups are done for every row that we find. So they can multiply the cost based on how many rows we find. This is one of the reasons that I find execution plans a little deceiving. This stuff up here is only done once. This stuff here, this is really three dimensional. Every time that SQL Server found a row up here in the index seek, SQL Server has to do a separate key lookup. If we find 100,000 rows up here, SQL Server has to jump around, jump around, and do 100,000 different key lookups. I really wish that these were three-dimensional. I wish they popped off the page based on the number of times that they were executed. Because this down here makes it look like it's just one key lookup, but really it was done 150,000 times because we found 150,000 different rows. SQL Server has to figure out which one of these is going to be the most cost effective before your query even starts. This is another one of those cool things about Oracle that always amazes me. They can adjust execution plans mid-flight. SQL Server designs an execution plan and then executes it, and it doesn't matter if it starts to go horribly wrong or not. SQL Server doesn't adjust its plan halfway through. Another thing that's really funny with it is if the execution plan goes to hell in a handbasket, and then you execute the query again. SQL Server doesn't stop and go, hold on a second. I remember that had a whole lot of blood all over it the last time I ran it. Maybe I should think again about the second time that I... No! SQL Server builds the execution plan once and runs it forever. As long as that thing stays up in cache, SQL Server will keep that crappy execution plan up there. So SQL Server has to make this decision before the query even starts, and it's not allowed to pop open the tables and start reading data in order to figure things out. SQL Server is going to go build an execution plan and then sum up the costs of all the operators in it. Then it's going to go back, kind of like a choose your own adventure book, and choose a different plan. It's going to go try to build other versions of the plan, doing table scans versus index seeks, processing different tables first, and then figure out which one of the versions is the lowest cost, and it runs with that. I have a sip of my tasty beverage. I always, I want to talk a million miles an hour, and I want to continuously keep going, because there's so many things that I get excited to share, you, share with you. I really get this disturbingly excited all the time about databases, which is just kind of weird. Now, I'm simplifying this a lot. If you want to learn more about how the cost-based optimizer works, there are entire books written about this and how SQL Server comes up with those costs. You can learn more about it over at brentozar.com slash go slash cost-based. And we talk more about it in Fundamentals of Query Tuning and also in Mastering Query Tuning as well. There's all kinds of things to learn about it, but the one thing that's the most important to learn is that the biggest thing SQL Server uses to influence this data is statistics. For every index you create, SQL Server creates a statistic with the same name. A statistic is one 8K page of metadata 
about the contents of the object involved. For example, here we're talking about our index on last access date. SQL Server makes one 8K page describing the contents of this index. And if you query other columns, columns that aren't indexed, for example, SQL Server will automatically build index, build a statistics for you. For example, this is a statistic on the fifth column of the table. This is a statistic on the eighth column of the table. Statistics help SQL Server guess how many rows are going to come back, which index it should use, should the query go parallel or not, how much memory should we allocate to the query. These are incredibly important for SQL Server. This is where it's kind of weird. I don't want to say that they're incredibly important for you. But here I am mentioning them in your very first two hour class on SQL. So why am I mentioning them? If you're probably not going to look at them, and, and to be honest, I don't. I don't want to be condescending. I don't want you to think that I'm over here. Oh, I got to read me some statistics. But knowing that statistics exist helps to shape the way that you respond to query tuning. There's a command, dbcc show statistics. It's totally safe to run. You pass in two things. The first thing is the name of the table that's involved. The second thing is the name of the index or statistic, if you're looking at system created statistics. Totally safe to run. It returns instantly, because after all, it's just looking at one 8K page. That's all the data that we have to work with. And when you look at this, you can start to see where SQL Server's coming up with query plans. For example, in this one, this statistic says there are rows, there are about 300,000 rows in the table. And then here's a histogram that defines the shape of the data. We have an entire free class on statistics on our YouTube channel, and I'll link to it here in a couple of slides as well, that talk about, for example, interpreting this histogram. This histogram is based on dates because we're talking about the index on last access date. So you see down there on the left hand side, there's a list of ranges that are all dates based on different last access dates. Because a statistic is just one 8K page, this histogram is kind of sketchy. It can only have a max of 201 different buckets to describe the shape of your data. And 201 buckets is not a lot when it comes to databases that have been up for years that all have all kinds of peaks and valleys in their distribution. Here, we're talking about last access date. So you might think that SQL Server would create a bucket for every month or for every two weeks. And that's not how it works at all. If you look down those list of dates, they're all over the place. Some of them are really short date ranges. Some of them are really wide date ranges. SQL Server is trying to paint the best picture that it can of your data using just 201 buckets or less. Other data types like integers and strings also get similar histograms. On the left hand side, I have a histogram based on the reputation column, which is an integer. Over on the right hand side, I have one based on display name. So you can kind of see how those different things shape up. For example, over on the right hand side, if I'm looking for people named Alexander, there's a bucket for Alexander. SQL Server says, if you're looking for Alexander, I know that there are exactly 98 people who match Alexander. If you're looking for Alexandra, there's not a bucket for Alexandra. There is, however, this bucket here, the next one, Alexandra, is going to be alphabetically next in this list. So SQL Server says anything in between these two values, I know that an average of 1.367 rows are going to come back. So SQL Server is going to guess 1.367 rows will come back for Alexandra. SQL Server is using this technique anytime it's looking at your WHERE clause trying to figure out how many rows are going to come back. For example, here, we're asking for all the last access dates after 7-1 of 2014. 
So SQL Server pops open this histogram on last access date. It pages down through the histogram. SQL Server just literally stands there hitting the page down key. Also, I don't understand how the word literally works. Goes down through the statistics histogram, finds the bucket that has July the 1st in it. Notice that there's not a separate bucket just for July the 1st. SQL Server guesses how many rows out of this bucket are going to match, and then scans down through the rest of the buckets, adding them up add it up, add it up. And then that's how it comes up with the estimated number of rows that are going to match your where clause. It does a really good job a lot of the time. Here, SQL Server estimated that 148,000 rows were going to come back. In reality, 148,000 rows came back. That is freaking phenomenal because we had stats on that column. The stats were up to date. Our query was easy to understand. And we weren't running any funky calculations on it. But that's not always true in real life. In real life, lots of things can go wrong. And to illustrate that, I'm going to use a slightly different query. I'm going to use a start and an end date. I'm going to say, show me all the users who access the system in between July the 1st and August the 1st. I'm going to use precise date ranges for the start and end. Then I'm going to run another query right below it that conceptually does the same thing. You and I can look at this and understand that it's going to produce exactly the same results as this. And indeed, when I hit execute, they both bring back 728 rows. They both bring back exactly the same rows. Look at their execution plans. They're different. When I precisely passed in a start and an end date, SQL Server used an index, and SQL Server accurately estimated how many rows were going to come back. But when I did the function, SQL Server estimated that 1,700 rows were going to come back instead of 700. The way these numbers work on execution plans is SQL Server saying, I brought back 728 rows of an estimated 1,774 rows. My estimates were off by, say, 41%. So here, all of a sudden, his estimate is way far off. And also, he's ignoring an index. We have an index here. SQL Server is refusing to use that. There's another difference between these two execution plans. The top one, because it uses the index, doesn't need to sort anything. There's an order by last access date, but our index is already sorted by date. Here, because we're not using the index, we're having to sort the data as well. Let's see the overhead of that and see how much worse that makes our query by using that set statistics time on thing that we looked about earlier. When I passed in specific dates, SQL Server did the index seek plus key lookups. It read less data. It used less CPU time. And the query ran faster. Every way that I can measure it, these functions worked worse than just passing in the specific dates that I wanted. Something that I tell query authors all the time is that the easier it is for a human being to understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish, the more likely it is that you're going to get a good execution plan. You and I know that when we go ahead and uh, give it specific start and end dates, SQL Server can die bomb into one area of the index. You and I can look at this and say, well, SQL Server, you could just die bomb in to July the 1st, read out the rows that match, and bail. But SQL Server doesn't know that. In addition, SQL Server may not think it can use this index, but it could. Let's prove it. I'm going to take just this one query, and I'm going to run it two different ways. 
I'm going to start by running it by letting SQL Server choose which indexes it's going to use. Then I'm going to give it a hint. Hey, SQL Server, the trash is starting to smell. I'm going to give it a hint and say, I want you to use the index. And the query works. It doesn't fix the estimates. The estimates are still incorrect. However, SQL Server absolutely can use this index. It's an index scan, not a seek. Still, SQL Server could use this index. And it would go faster. When I force the index, it does less logical reads, less CPU time, and less query duration. So why, if it's possible for SQL Server to use an index, why is SQL Server refusing to use an index? You'll run into this question all the time inside your career. And the way that you do that is you run it once letting SQL Server choose and once forcing it the way that you want the query to run, and then go compare the query costs between the two, the estimated query costs. I got to make sure to make that clear. Here, when SQL Server chose, it chose the table scan, and the estimated query cost was 5.8 query bucks. When I gave it a hint, and I said, I want you to use the index, the query cost was higher. Remember how I said earlier, SQL Server will generally choose the query cost or the query plan with the lowest cost. Here, SQL Server looks between those two and says, hey, look, clearly this one is less query books. This is the one that I should use. So how is a query that's slower cheaper? How is a query that's faster more expensive in terms of query books? It all comes back to our estimates. SQL Server estimated that 1,774 rows were going to come back. They didn't. Less rows came back. If its estimate was correct, maybe a table scan would have been better. But its estimate was wrong because SQL Server couldn't understand our syntax. With this syntax, it's really straightforward and easy for SQL Server to pop open the histogram and understand exactly what st uh, stats it needs to use. For this, SQL Server doesn't have stats on the year of last access date plus the month of last access date. It could, but it doesn't. So what have you learned so far? Key lookup means that the query wanted more columns than were available inside the non-clustered index. SQL Server wanted to use the non-clustered index, but because it didn't have all the columns that we needed, SQL Server had to go look things up by their key. Before the query starts, SQL Server has to calculate the tipping point where it makes sense to just ignore your indexes and do a table scan instead of all those back and forth key lookups. SQL Server makes those decisions using cost-based optimizations. It calculates estimated subtree costs for each of the query plans it comes up with, but they're only estimates, and they can totally be wrong. The easier your syntax is to understand, odds are the more accurate your query costs are going to be, and odds are the better of an execution plan you're going to get. All right, so next up, next up, we had these two queries where we had good syntax and then we had kind of crappy syntax. And SQL Server was having to make a decision between an index seek and a key lookup versus a table scan. When you see an index seek and a key lookup, you want to hover your mouse over that key lookup and you want to look at the output list. <coughs> Excuse me look at the output list, and you want to start to think about maybe does it make sense to add these frequently used columns into our index? Because if I can put everything that I need into this index, then SQL Server won't have to choose whether or not to do key lookups. It's already got everything that it needs right here. Let's do that. Let's make our index a little bit wider. Grab the third page out of your PDF handouts. Ooh. 
the gray page out of your PDF handouts. This is what results if I add two more columns to my index. If I add two more columns to my index for display name and age, now even my crappy query uses it. Here I've got the crappy query that's using functions across both. Now, even the crappy query uses it because SQL Server doesn't have to make a decision about index seek plus key lookup. It can just say, oh, I don't need to do key lookups. I don't have to worry about that. I'll just use the covering index for this. Uh, Richie says that, oh, I <laughs> got you, got you. So because I don't have to worry about that decision, good indexes can actually reduce the impact of sketchy T-SQL. All the time when I'm working with clients, I try to choose the quickest, easiest way past the finish line. For me, that's usually index tuning, just because I can make a few index changes and then immediately make all kinds of queries go faster, even when queries aren't doing written exactly the way that I would want to have them. So why don't I just add all kinds of columns to every index? Well, if I compare the old and new indexes, the new index is physically larger than the old index. I know what you're saying. Wait a minute, Brent, they're both 8K pages. Well, yeah, but the stack of this stack of paper is going to be higher because it has more columns in it. I can fit less users per 8K page on this index. And I can measure that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use the SP Blitz index from the first responder kit. The first responder kit is this collection of scripts, most of which start with SP Blitz, that help you rapidly assess your database and help you figure out how to make it go faster. And I've got a whole course on that in Fundamentals Week, actually, on how to use the first responder kit. And one of the ways that I love doing it is by looking at one specific table's indexes. In this case, I'm going to look at SP Blitz index users table. And it's going to return all kinds of data, but I'm just going to focus on the first result set, which tells me I have these two indexes. I got my index that's just on last or last access date and ID. That index is about five megabytes in size. Then I have my index that adds two more columns to that display name and age. That index is more than twice the size. Now these, of course, are extremely small size numbers because this is the small copy of the Stack Overflow database. But the more indexes that you have and the more columns that are on each index, the more you start to run into maintenance related costs, the larger that your database becomes, the more time that database backups and restores take, the more time that check DB takes, index rebuilds, all that kind of thing. Normally when clients come to me, they have one of two problems. Either they have way too many indexes. People have been creating indexes left and right because they thought they were free with every extra index or slowing down inserts, updates and deletes, or they don't have enough indexes because they've been terrified to go create them. These are the warning signs that you fall into one of those two categories. We go into much more details about that in the fundamentals and mastering index tuning classes. As you go about learning about databases, you'll have you'll hear people say things like you can just include columns in an index and it'll be much lower cost. That simply isn't true. To explain why what I mean by that, let's show you the difference with the index that includes display name and age. They're not sorted, they're just included in the index. Well, if I look at the size of the index that had them in the key versus the index that has them in the includes. Here's the one that has them in the key. Here's the one that has them in the includes. The size is the same. Because their 8K pages have the same stuff on it. If I'm going to include columns, then they have to be put on the 8K page. It doesn't really make a difference whether those columns are sorted or not. Now, yes, when things get really large, 
it does start to make an extremely small difference, but we're talking about less than 1%. The other reason people will say includes are cool is they say, well, look, if I only include a column, then I don't have to move the row around on the page as that data changes. That's not true either. Let's go back to our pages here. Let's say that user 643 here, Mr. Sarcastic, got a year older. And we're going to change Sarcastic's age from 30 to 31. These people will say, well, if it's only included, I don't have to worry about moving him around on the page. Well, yeah, but whenever you change it, you still have to pull that page up into memory, get a lock on it, write the change to it, and then push it back down to disk. Now, let's see what happens if age is part of the key. I'll say, well, you have to do all that again, too. Plus, you have to move the row. You have to get it up into memory. You have to lock it. You have to write the change. That change may need to move the row to a different place. And then we got to push it back down to disk. OK, Speedy, if I change his age from 30 to 31, where does he move? Point to where on your monitor Sarcastic is going to move to if I change his age from 30 to 31, where on the monitor does he move? He doesn't move at all. Because the first column in our index is last access date. Last access date is extremely selective. Hell, I could change his age to 131. I could change his name from sarcastic to optimistic. I could even change his ID. But because that first row is so selective, it doesn't really matter what happens to columns later on in the list. When you're designing indexes, I'll tell people what's really important is to get the first one or two columns right. Get the first one or two columns right, and then from that point on, it doesn't really matter what's inside the index. Yes, you can have too much, by all means, especially if you start to index hot columns that change all the time. But most of the time, I, I don't really care whether you put it in the key or the includes. I don't want you to think that includes are somehow magically lightweight and delicious because they don't really help you in terms of page size, like the number of pages that you need for the index. And it doesn't really help you that much in terms of resorting rows because your first couple of columns are going to be so selective anyway. Generally speaking, the stuff that's inside your where clause, your group by, and your order by should go early on in the keys. And then after that, if you want to put things in the select, if you want to put them inside the keys or the includes, I'm really fine either way. The important thing is to get the first couple of columns right, and I teach you how to do that in my Fundamentals of Index Tuning class. So what we learned inside this last module here was the less columns that I have on an index, the less beneficial my index is. When I had the index that was just on last access date and ID, that wasn't very helpful for me because I was constantly doing these key lookups and then having to flip over to table scans. Now, bigger indexes do have or more columns on my indexes help more queries. But then I have to be aware that I have to deal with longer maintenance jobs and I can run into blocking. Now, we've covered a whole lot in the last 90 minutes. Next, you go to brentozar.com slash go slash engine. I go into more details on this course. I have written versions of the course plus web, uh, video versions of the course, all completely free, where I go dive off into different ver <coughs> different uh, uh, T-SQL things, different index things that are affected by this all kinds of stuff, a whole new world. And you could really spend the next day going through all the blog posts that I've got in here that just cover how to think like the engine. I always want people to exhaust the free resources first. Go look at the free things that are out there on the blog. And when you're done with those, then...
then upgrade to the paid stuff like my fundamentals classes. The next leap from here is to figure out how I use the first responder kit, my fundamentals of index tuning, my fundamentals of query tuning, and all of that is over in my fundamentals week class that runs uh, May 6th through 10th, runs next month. In there, it's uh, all online, it's interactive, where you're running queries against the Stack Overflow database. You don't have to, but I encourage students to follow along, and I give them homework exercises as we go. And plus, I even interpret some of the results out of your first responder kit scripts on your server so that you can help get started on figuring out which queries you should focus on first, which queries you should focus on tuning, which tables you should focus on index tuning, and more. All of that is over at brentozr.com slash go slash fun. That is the end of today's lecture. Tomorrow, when we get together, I'll be doing this exact same thing, but doing it in SQL Server Management Studio, which lets me go down different routes with demos and show you slightly different techniques as well. I hope you had fun. I hope you enjoyed yourself, and I'll see you on tomorrow's webcast or in Fundamentals Week. Adios, y'all.